Hello everybody and welcome to this month's Contract Administration Practice Group. Uh, but with that, I do want to hand it over to Douglas and Jim to get started with today's session on observation reports. So Douglas and Jim, over to you. Thank you, Matthew. Welcome everyone back. Hope everyone had a great summer. Yeah, same here. It's good to have you back. I look forward to diving in. Let's go ahead and jump in and get started. The first slide here uh, talks about the purpose for construction observation reports. Uh, we've talked in the past about doing site visits and doing site reports, and today we're going to delve in a little bit more into the actual report itself. So just as a reminder, AIA contract documents, uh, the General Conditions A201 states that the architect is to visit the site at intervals appropriate to the stage of the contractor's operations to become generally familiar with and to keep the owner informed about the progress and quality of the portions of the work completed, two, to endeavor to guard the owner against defects and deficiencies in the work, and three, to determine in general if the work is being performed in a manner indicating that the work when fully complete will be in accordance with the contract documents. So per our contract requirements, those three purposes are the reasons why we visit the site. Now the report that we do, I would su suggest, should address those three reasons for us visiting the site. And again, it's to report the progress of the work and the quality of the work, to report any observed deficiencies, and to assess conformance with the uh, contract documents. So when you are writing your field observation report, I would suggest you keep those three things in mind and make sure that your report addresses those, at least those three, three items. Uh, and again, the purpose is to become generally familiar with the work, we're not required to know everything that's going on. Uh, we are required to report deficiencies that we observe and to uh, keep the owner informed to protect the owner. I'm sorry, to protect the owner and, and relay. So the report is, is, the way I look at the report is prepared to address these three items for the owner. So the audience, in my opinion, for the field observation report is primarily for the owner. I cut somebody off. I don't know if that, that, was, that, that was... I'm sorry, Jim and Doug. This is Sal. I just wanted... First of all, thanks for having me on the call today. And I just wanted to add something to this particular slide. As good contract administrators, one of our duties, uh, and, and I know there, this, the purpose of today is to talk about observation reports, but uh, one of the things that we learn um, in the field from doing this as good contract administrators, we take back, we get feedback and we take that information back to the office, to the designers and, and uh, the specifiers who are, and you may be one and the same, that are putting these things together. Um, and one of the things that came out of the, uh, the workshop that we're going to be doing in Charlotte in, in November here, and it's called Claims, Disputes, and Critical Decisions. What we do is we analyze um, some uh, court cases or disputes uh, uh, that arise, and uh, obviously we all get into disputes every once in a while, and sometimes there's a, a crossroads and you don't know which way to go. Well, one of the things, the feedback we get from that, we, we learn, okay, how can we avoid this problem? And this slide that Jim and Doug have up here is absolutely uh, one that has come in front of the courts many, many times, and I want to particularly point out item number two, which Jim and Doug talked about here. To endeavor to guard the owner against defects and deficiencies in the work. Those words right there have gotten us as architects and contract administrators in trouble because if you read that and read that to a layperson, it says, you will guard me as an owner against any deficiencies and defects. In other words, if a contractor makes a mistake, puts a defective product in, puts it in wrong, you name it, any worst case scenario, we are responsible for that defect. That's what that's saying to the, and I'm not saying I believe that, but that's what the court, that's how the courts read that. So the feedback here, if I can just interject, is that I would, and I've changed this language in our documents. We came back and said, okay, this is getting us into trouble. So 
we changed it to read something on this flavor, and you could, you know, change the words how you like it. But it, ours says to endeavor to keep the execution of the work consistent with the design concept of the project, because I can't guard against all the defects. Frankly, I think the AA has got this wrong. It's not our job as contract administrators to, to guard against all the defects, particularly ones that are hidden. Uh, and, and if you're on the site that day and it happens, you know, there's a, there's a you know, sense, sense of responsibility. So to protect us, we've changed that language. And I think that's one of our jobs as contract administrators is to help the design professionals do their, do their job a little bit better. But just want to interject there, and I apologize for the, the pause. Uh, Sal, this is Jim. I, I hope you will uh, maybe memorialize that and share it uh, because I think you know one of the things that's beautiful about CSI uh, and about other professional organizations like AIA uh, that you know, these documents are made to be revised and wording like that going forward could be really critical to our organ both those organizations, you know, getting the documents up to date. I think you're absolutely right. If 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 we find something like that that is the focus of a lot of attention in the courts and maybe we can make it better. Can Sal, this is Doug. Can you repeat the proposed or the substitute language again? Just so that sure. everybody yeah. I can not only repeat it, but I can send it to you, and you can send it out to all the listeners. But it, basically, it's and it's it's item number two. I, we our our wording says this: to endeavor to keep the execution of the work consistent with the design concept of the project. In the AA language, there's a lot of uh, information that they talk about the design content. Excuse me, the design concept or design intent, and we can only execute the work as contract administrators. We're not physically doing the work. We can only execute the contract based on that design intent or what's shown or what's not shown. If somebody makes a mistake, that's not our job. So that I think the, now there may be some tweaking in the language. I'm sure that there are people on this call a lot smarter than me and somebody can come up with some little bit better language that's maybe even more refined, and I'm certainly willing to hear that out. But the, the, to guard against defects and deficiencies is not what we do. But anyway, I'll, 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 I'll send it over to Jim and Doug, and you can share it with the group. And uh, that, this is actually, oh, I'm actually going to sneak in here. This is Matt. Mark um, had a question here with regards to the, the comment, Sal, that you made and the information there. I uh, was wondering, do consensus docs potentially have better contract language in this regards? Um, to the CCA duties um, regarding against defects. Um, so I guess from your experience, all three of you on the call here, do you have a better experience with AIA's wording versus consensus docs versus any others that you've used? Or do you find it all to be similar um, and you may want to go back and look at that in all of your documents? Oh, this is Sal, I'll jump in. I, I'm not that familiar with consensus docs. I've read them but I didn't study them that hard or do a whole lot of comparison. I know in the, in the CA academies, we do compare a few of the items along the way. Do, um, uh, Greg Markling's great at that. He's, he's, got, he's got comparisons. But in this particular case, I think Consent Stocks is silent on this particular aspect on what our roles are as design professionals or, and contract administrators. I'm pretty sure they're fairly silent on it. Um, but uh, and, and with this particular aspect in mind that we're talking about, but uh, I, I could be wrong. Yeah, my experience is like Sal's. I'm I'm not I have not typically used consensus stocks either. So that's something that would be good for us to be able to draw a comparison to maybe in um, future webinars. All right. Any other questions, Matthew? Yeah, we had one other one that was a question slash comment. Um, just verifying, uh, since we're talking about CDs here, um, the CDs include all documents, including um, MEP and structural as well. I wanted to verify if that was a, a correct assumption here. Construction documents are typically also defined in the contract documents and the um, general conditions. And they would include, typically, the drawings, 
that the architects prepared, the drawings that all of his consultants have prepared, and the specifications that they have prepared. And then that would extend down through the bidding process into any addendums that have been issued. And then when you get into construction, it would also include um, change orders, uh, supplemental instructions, and any kind of those types of documents that actually change the requirements of the contract documents. So it would include the MEP documents as well. Great. That, that's all we have at the moment. Okay, let's keep going to the next slide. And you will see on there a form for a field observation report. Now what's shown is the form that CSI prepares uh, that you can uh, use. AIA documents also has a form. Uh, the CSI form is the 9.1A. The AIA document form is the G711. So there are similar in, in their content. Um, I've also seen most firms that create their own custom form and there are apps out there now that are available and there's four listed there that uh, you can use to produce the report and then they print out their own uh, format or form and it's uh, similar again content wise to the CSI form and the AIA form. Um, with the applications, the only one that I'm actually using and familiar with hands-on is the new form of, uh, I know with theirs and I'm assuming with the others you can go in and you can make tweaks and modifications to the form. You can customize it, add your logo and your firm information and that type of thing uh, to the form so that it is uh, carries through with the branding that you use. So at this point, uh, before we go on to the next slide, I would ask Sal and Jim if they have anything to add, but then I'd also ask if there's anyone on the call that is familiar with or have used any of these other apps uh, for them to uh, let Matthew know if there's anything that they want to share. Uh, these things are relatively new. And like I said, the only one I'm familiar with is Newformer. I will say one thing about the Newformer uh, app or program is that one of the things that I like about it is that it actually will track the items that you note know that are deficient or non-conforming to the work so that those things don't get lost by the wayside. Um, so, and Jim, is there anything you want to, want to add? Um, or have either of you... Know you no, I, I'm like you, Doug. I have uh, used Newforma on a limited basis, but uh, none of the others. So I'd be interested to hear what anybody in the audience has experience with. Yeah, this is Sal. I think I'm in the same boat. Although we've been doing it electronically, we haven't really used the apps, but I'd be very interested in uh, hearing about them. Um, well, we haven't heard anything from the audience on this, but while we're waiting for somebody that may want to step in, um, we did want to point out that Drusella Brookshire pointed out uh, the wording on the last slide looks to have come from the 1997 version of the 201. Um, however, the 2007 version um, states um, a fairly large difference um, that Drusella points out might, have, might be an indication that AI realized some of the problem related to the previous statement and has tried to correct it. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing from Giselle right here because it's about a paragraph of language that was added in the, the 07 version, but just want to make that note to people. Um, you may want to look into that and see which version you're using as well, and then check from there to what language might be appropriate. She is correct. The language that I had on that last slide was from the 1997, P201. Okay. Um, Still not seeing anything else from the audience as it relates to um, relates to any of the new apps here that are on the screen, though. Um, actually, Laura, Laura, we have your hand raised, so I'm going to unmute you here. Uh, Laura, hopefully we can hear you. Maybe not. Um, 
So, uh, Laura, I'm going to leave your line unmuted for a few more seconds just in case there's some audio on your end. Um, but I see nobody else with their hand raised and no other comments in the comment box related to any of these new apps. Okay, well, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, I would ask, though, that if there is anyone on the call that is familiar with any of these apps or has used them to let Matthew know or get in touch with Jim or I, um, I really would be interested to hear others' experiences with them. So let's uh, move on to the next slide. And on the next slide, we will talk about some of the uh, information that goes on to the form. And we mentioned before branding, the firm information, your company logo, address, contact information. That should always be on these uh, reports. There should be a report number for identification purposes so you can know and reference which report uh, you may be discussing. The project information, obviously with the name and address of the project, the owner, and your project ID number, and depending on the type of project and who your owner is, you may end up having multiple project ID numbers. Typically, the architect's office will have a project ID number, and uh, I know in North Carolina, the state on projects, state projects, they have their own state project ID number that has to be on there. So. Uh, all of that is for the purposes of identifying the project. Uh, date and time of the site visit, weather conditions, temperature, person's contact, or the person's present at site. Um, for temperature, I have seen, and I just want to comment on a couple of these, and then I'll be quiet and let Sal and Jim add in. But for temperature, I typically will put a range. Uh, and not try to be specific as to 76 degrees, I might say mid-70s or 70s. Um, I was in a meeting one time um, on a project where the person that had done the field report had put 73 degrees or whatever it was that was on the report. And then the contractor, during this large meeting with consultants and actually had owners reps and finance folks it was a large meeting the uh, contractor for some reason had an issue with the fact that it wasn't 73 degrees at the time that the uh, report was made or that the guy was out on site and he was saying no it wasn't 73 degrees it was 78 degrees I and mean, this was you know it's a minor difference but it became an issue at the meeting and just to avoid stuff like that, I usually will put a range or mid-70s or something like that, not trying to be too specific. Um, I think it is important to put the conditions down there, the weather conditions and temperature. It helps to substantiate that you were actually on site uh, and knew what was going on on site so you can avoid some, some of those issues. Um, Person's contact with present at site, uh, I typically will try to address who is there that may be walking the site with me, but not trying to identify every individual trade or workman that's out on site. I've seen in some reports where the uh, person writing the report will try to identify all of the major, all of the subcontractors. You know, the painter had three guys, the mechanical uh, contractor had four guys installing duct work. I usually will not get into that type of detail. Uh, I usually was, was for President site, it was me, the project superintendent, if he walks the site with me, or I will note I met with the project superintendent in the trailer and then I walk the site by myself. So um, I don't know, Jim, what your experience has been or sell if you want to chime in on anything on this slide. Yeah, Jim, go Jim, I'll, well, okay, thanks, Sal. Uh, a couple of things that uh, I will throw out as uh, points to ponder, and I've half heard uh, pluses and minuses for both. One uh, is in reference to the time, you know, whether you put your start and finish time uh, while you're on the site so that it's documented as to what was going on and what you were able to observe while you were there so that you're 
sort of creating the boundaries of what wasn't exhaustive uh, observation of the site, and also uh, how actually you document the information. Uh, I have worked with firms uh, who used a more narrative form of capturing uh, what was going on at the site uh, versus a more bullet type or numerical form of what was going on at the site. And uh, even though they may be capturing a lot of the same information, those narrative forms I have seen uh, were quite nicely done and very much appreciated by the client because it was more of a, a conversation about what they were observing. I don't know that it uh, um, don't know that it captured anything any differently or affected risk management in one way or another, but I thought it was interesting. That's all I have. All good information. The only thing I'd like to add, um, and I concur with Doug and Jim on their their uh, input, is one of the things, and it's a pet peeve of mine, um, we're not the only ones doing report, the field reports. And, 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 and for example, we all have consultants. So if my MEP consultant or my structural consultant or whoever it is is also doing a field report, I want them to use the same format. And obviously, we'd like it to go through us if we're the lead. So. Um, you know, what do we call in those reports? And, you know, if I do field report one or observation report one and they have one, it gets confusing. So we like to coordinate that with all our consultants and, and let them know we'll control the numbering so that in case we ever have to look it up or identify it, it's, it's not, there's no confusion. There's not seven reports n uh, number two, for example. But the other thing is the project identification, and I, I think Doug did a good job. Um, it's important to have, um, and our, most of our clients want their identification on their, their project number, which is obviously different than our maybe our in-house project number. But these are for filing purposes. So I think both identification numbers are important, the, the number that the client would use because they're going to file it and we're going to file it as well. Uh, so you have to think about that. Oh, the other the thing came to mind, the complication for us, and you may, maybe the listeners don't have it as much as I do, but here in Pennsylvania, a lot of our public projects are separate primes. So now we have field reports for each prime, and we have to give that an identification, not a, uh, excuse me, a, a report number, which is different because you might have, you know, report number one for, for mechanical and plumbing and electrical and general. So it gets confusing, but somebody's got to take the bull by the horns and be the, the gatekeeper and, and keeping all these stuff in line because we, 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 do, we do them for a reason, and you have to be able to file them and retrieve them, and, and if you don't, then it's, it's total chaos. Anything from the audience, Matthew? Uh, nothing at this point. We are all kind of quiet on this end. Okay, let's keep going then and move on to the next slide. Uh, we're, here we're talking about more of the meat of the report, the actual contents in which you should put in a report other than the standard identifying information. Um, first comment is to report your observations. This is an observation report, so you're going to document what it is that you see when you're on site. And keep in mind that this is a, a record of a point in time that you are out there on site on that day at that time, and it's not to predict what's going to happen when you're gone, what's going to happen next week or, or tomorrow. It's not to uh, report what happened yesterday. It is a report of what your observations are when you're on site at that particular time. Your observations should represent the status of the project as a whole, as well as oh, differential, differentiate different, excuse me ongoing task, um, give an overall picture of the overall status of the work, and then add in comments about the individual ongoing activities that are taking place. Uh, you might say that, um, as an example, work is proceeding on with the building exterior skin installation. It appears to be 50% complete. Uh, contractor is currently installing windows on the north elevation. If our 
something to that effect. So you talk about the overall status as well as individual ongoing tasks. Uh, percentage complete of the project or the various stages, the, the building appears to be 75% complete would be an example of giving a, a completion of the overall project then you might continue on to give a percent complete of an individual task. Windows are 30% complete. They've got windows installed on the north elevation. Um, work progress schedule and again all of this is leading back to the purposes that were out there is to communicate with the owner for those three matters that we discussed previously from the general conditions. So those items need to be addressed. So work progress compared to schedule. Are they ahead, behind, how far ahead, behind? Comments like that need to be included. You need to be objective, factual, and complete in your observation reports. Um, they should not be absolute. Steel erection appears to be complete would be an example and not say steel erection has been completed. Um, it may look to you like it's complete. Your structural engineer may have a different opinion. It may be something that needs to be removed and replaced or corrected. Uh, so try not to be absolute unless you are absolutely sure that it is an absolute, if that makes sense. So include items that are non-conforming or action items. I've heard it called uh, non-conforming items, items that the contractor needs to correct, however, whatever terminology you want to use, but you need to include uh, observations of work that does not comply with the requirements in the contract documents. Uh, that is one of the purposes for making the site visit and for doing the reports, to keep the owner informed and to, uh, as the AIA general conditions currently say, endeavor to guard the owner against defects. And as uh, Sal was saying, to keep the execution of the work consistent with the design intent. So you need to document those items that don't conform with the work. When you do that, be clear, concise, straightforward, so that it is easily understood what it is that is the issue. An example here uh, would be the, um, I'm drawing a blank, the door frame was installed not square. The contractor needs to straighten the door frame. So you don't, I would not just say fix the door frame. Here on the, on the screen I've got repair scratch on countertop. Not the common type has a scratch in it. Um, and again, you need to be mindful of who your audience is. These reports are going to the owner. So you need to make sure that you are communicating with the owner and using terminology and, and language that the owner is going to understand. Uh, these reports do also go to the contractor and you're also sharing information with the contractor. But you, you need to remember that the primary purpose for these reports is to keep the owner informed and that's who you want to communicate with. So you want him to be able to read it and understand it, whereas if you were just addressing the contractor, some of the language that you are using might be more construction related that you and the contractor might understand that the owner might have questions about. So again, keep in mind who your audience is. So, and Jim, yeah, this is Jim. I, I would, I just would add a, a comment here that you uh, touched on when we talked about New Forma. And, you know, one of the things that makes all of this successful in the construction administration phase is having good general conditions or supplementary general conditions and describing not only what you're going to do but how that's going to be executed. So if you reach agreements on uh, how action items or non-conforming work are going to be documented and some agreement to how they're going to be addressed, 
then I, I've seen it be very successful for these to be reoccurring comments until they are corrected. So for action items, they may be in your report and stay in your report until whatever action that's required has been uh, completed. And then, as we talked about before with non-conforming work, uh, you might note that in your observation, but there are also CSI forms uh, and AIA forms for non-conforming work. And you may want to back up your site observation with one of those forms so that it is stipulated in a different format than just an observation and giving direction uh, specifically for corrective action. That's a, a very good point uh, Jim is making about the other forms that you might want to use for notifying someone of non-conforming work. Um, another thing I would suggest is that when you are documenting these non-conforming items or action items or work deficiencies, I would suggest you have a, a separate section on your field report and put all those items in that section. So. If you got an observation that says, uh, you know, a comment arrived on site, uh, met with the general contractor, and proceeded to walk the site, that might be one item. That would not go in the section where I had action items. So I'm saying, you know, masonry work is started on the foundation walls. That's not an action item. If you got an action item, I would say just have that in a separate section so that people know that they can go to that section of, the, of your field report and see what it is that needs to have the actions corrected or action taken on it. And as Jim was also mentioning, I've seen it done where those items stay on that report until they are corrected. Um, I've also seen where those items end up on a separate tracking log or list and so that they're not on each and every report but they're on a separate document. So they come off the report and go to a second document and then they're tracked that way. So that way your reports aren't four, five, six pages long. Um, you also need to consider when you're doing that how you're going to handle those issues that your consultant team raises. Do you pull their items off of their field reports and put them on your field report and have them all there? Or do they just reside on theirs? I know with new forma, uh, that was one of the things I was mentioning before, if you got the whole team on new forma, then when uh, a consultant has an item, new forma tracks it and pulls it out on a separate action item list and it stays on that list until it gets addressed. This is Sal Duggan. I, I want to just say that this slide is fantastic and I want to emphasize what you, the way you presented it was great. I, I want to emphasize the word factual um, and, and what we do. We, it's very important that when we write any observations we be extremely factual. We do not editorialize at all. It, and writing observations is much like we write a spec. When we write a specification, we don't editorialize. We're factual. We're to the point. Everything that Jim and Doug has mentioned here. And what I'm trying to say is don't editorialize because nothing will get you in a dispute faster than if you editorialize in an observation with a contractor, particularly if you use sharp words. Simple example. There's millions of them, but very simple example. Um, let's just assume that the do documents call for this site in most general conditions require the site to be kept in a clean environment. You know, clean up after yourself, pick up after every day's work. If you editorialize and, and as you're walking through, you know a lot of, notice a lot of debris laying around, and you write the word, for example, you might say that the, the uh, site cleanup is sloppy, and you that's an editorialization as opposed to ex ex excessive debris appears to be on the site. That, 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 that's too, the same observation, but just worded a little differently. The contractor will take offense to the word sloppy and things like that. You can, you, and that's just a simple example. I could, there's a hundred of them that I've seen. And I've seen them go to court where they pointed that out in the courtroom where they said, you know, you wrote this, um, you know, in, in that, ex that extent. So 
you, we, we try to work with contractors and, and we want to, you know, work up front and be honest and, and, and work towards the ultimate goal, but we don't want to poke them in the eye and, and, and as we're going along here. To me, the editorialization, that's all it is. So we, we need to be careful on our words. Good slide. And that's an excellent point. And that holds true not just for field observa observation reports, but any communication that you're having on emails especially. A lot of times, because uh, it's so quick and easy and, and casual, we tend to do a lot of editorializing in emails. And as we've discussed here before, every piece of paper, every document, every communication that you have is discoverable in court. So if you're putting it in an email, you can best believe if you get into trouble, somebody's going to look at it and there might be somebody that you don't want to see it. So. Those comments about sloppy or this is the worst masonry job I've ever seen, and you want to stay away from that kind of editorializing. Anything from our audience, Matthew? Yeah, we had a few people pop in here uh, with looking for your feedback or input uh, and experience on the inclusion of photographs um, of observations to not only clarify any questions you may have noticed but also serve as a good um, barometer of sorts for then comparing when the work is said to be completed. Um, so people would like to know about your opinion on that. We'll start with that and then have a few other comments um, following that conversation. That's actually the first topic on the next slide, so let's okay. hold that and, and see what other, other comments we have on this one. Another question from Barry was, uh, what if the contractor takes exception to your estimated percent complete? I'll start since Mayor uh, and Paul's. I don't know that I've ever had that happen, and if it has happened, it's been in evaluating payment applications. Um, it is my report. It is my professional opinion. I'm going to go with what I say. If the contractor disputes it, I don't have a problem with his, him disputing it. I don't have a problem with him documenting it, or I don't, would not have a problem even with myself documenting it. I say we're at fifty percent, and the contractor thinks we're at seventy-five percent. But if I'm reviewing the payout, I'm going to go with what my professional opinion is on that percent complete. Um, it's not a debate. It's not an argument. It may be a disagreement, but be gentlemen and agree to disagree cordially, and if need be, document what both parties' opinions are. Yeah, that, this is Jim. The, guy, the, the last thing you said there has been my experience that uh, worked. As you said, it's your report. It's your opinion of what the percentage of completion is. I'm glad to receive correspondence from the contractor telling me what her opinion is of the percentage complete and put that into the records as an official piece of correspondence. Uh, I, I do think if, it, if that is a focus of an issue, particularly as you said of an application for payment, then it may require some further response from you know, the, the architect. But it, it is just a piece of the communication and documentation of the project, and I, I've just asked that they explain, you know, what it is that gives them the percentage that that they believe the project to be. Yes, yeah, Sal. I think um, Jim and Doug are, are correct on that, and and it is just an opinion. Now, if someone is being hurt financially by it, I might take the schedule of values and go back and and look at those very, very closely, which we do anyway, uh, to the point where, you know, the masonry is at 50% and structural steel is at 90 and uh, we are we are trying to, to the best of our ability, use an average, but at the end of the day, the schedule of values will help us guide to the point where we have a good idea how far you are along just just by that, assuming that um, that those those what they're building for is correct and we just make it an observation. So prove us wrong. It's, it's uh, I think it's up to the contractor to prove us wrong, but typically we're not off more than 5%. I mean, none of us are trying to 
know, we're here to protect the owner, of course, but we want the contractor to get paid as well. So I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody's uh, maliciously trying to, um, you know, screw somebody over as far as payment. But if, I, if somebody's arguing over 5%, we've got another issue. But if they're, if it's 15 or 20%, okay, let's talk about it. But prove, me I'm wrong. prove to me that I'm wrong. Yeah, I agree with both Jim and Sal. And those conversations should be able to be had with the contractor without being confrontational. Anything else, Matthew? Yeah, we have a question kind of leading up and after that, um, and then one more following that yet. So um, talking about how we had talked about the percentage and also about the, the language that you should be using, uh, Deborah asks, it may be um, different for architects, but as an engineer consultant, uh, she's been told to state non-conforming work in a passive versus active language because they don't want to direct the contractor's work or have a con um, have a contact uh, contract with them. So I guess, what's your feedback on active versus passive voice when making those statements? I don't know that I have a strong opinion one way or the other. Not if it's factual, clear, concise, and you're you're being to the point, and you're not adding editorializing or fluff or puff. I don't know that it, it matters. Um, saying that the countertop has a scratch versus saying repair the scratch in the countertop, I think I would go with repair the scratch in the countertop. Um, just making the statement there's a scratch in it is not saying that it's not acceptable or that anything needs to be done. I guess you could say that the there's a scratch in the countertop that needs to be addressed or, or somehow you have to let them know that it's something that needs some action needs to be taken and just saying that there's a scratch to me doesn't necessarily mean that action needs to be taken. Okay. Um, going on to that then for additional areas where it might add on responsibility, Mark asks, um, how should you address uh, safety issues without getting yourself overcommitted to the situation or into a situation where you're being held responsible? So, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to go first. As Jim and I have discussed that topic on these webinars before, and I think it'd be nice to get a, a fresh perspective on it. Okay, I missed the furry first word you said there, Matt. Just repeat that one more time. I think I understood it. Oh, it was just asking. Um, Matt, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Sorry, there's a delay between when I unmute my line and when you can actually hear me. Um, the question was just asking uh, your opinion on statements of safety and whether or not, um, how would you word that to ensure that you don't add additional liability to yourself um, or be overcommitted to um, address the aspects of safety um, if made statements on observations for it? No, I think it's a good question. My opinion, obviously, uh, well, I won't give you an opinion first, but we obviously are not responsible for safety on the job site. But um, I think when it comes to uh, an issue that's quite obvious, um, they're not following um, the, the standards that we are accustomed to. And I don't know all the safety laws, and I'm not supposed to, but if there's something that's clear, clearly not safe, it's, um, I think it's important for us to address the issue, but not, not to the specific point where, um, you, know, you know, somebody's climbing a ladder incorrectly uh, or something like that, but um, I, it's up to us. And by the way, there's only one time that a design professional can stop the work, and, and that's where it's an extremely unsafe condition where a worker, let's say a worker's down in a ditch at 20 feet, there's no protection whatsoever. We can stop the work and get them out of there immediately. We, you can absolutely do that when, when, when the safety trumps those kind of things. But you have to be very careful because that's not our dilemma. So we, we note things in a general manner. We, manner. we can only reference back to the contract documents. And that's what I always try to do. Uh, I would say something like the safety conditions do not appear to be um, in accordance with the contract documents or, or or acceptable standards in the industry and make a note of that if, if it's obvious 
but I would never um, uh, question a contractor or a subcontractor on a safety issue unless I was absolutely sure what I was talking about and it was it was so detrimental that somebody's safety at that particular moment was in question. Um, you know, if I saw a ladder that, like for example, that was on a roof and it wasn't tied off at the top and people were using it, um, I think I would, uh, no, I would just make a note that you, we saw some safety issues, potential safety issues on the job site. And I might not get specific on it. Um, I might even verbally, if the su superintendent's standing there, and I might say, is that ladder tied off? A verbal thing. I might not put it in the report, but um, you know, those kind of things can get you in trouble. If somebody would, you're standing there and somebody would fall and get hurt, you're there. You're, you know, just by association, you're there. So, but we have to be very careful because it's not our job. And, and we, and we, um, we certainly are protected by the contract as well because it is the contractor's responsibility whether we're there or not. Um, but obvious things you have to report. And I think uh, I don't look for, I don't go out there looking for safety. Uh, violations. I do not do that. Uh, but I'm careful when I'm involved in If I'm climbing a ladder, if I'm in a scaffolding, I wear my hard hat. I do all the appropriate things that I need to do to protect me that by my contract. But it, it, it is a very touchy situation. So we have to be very careful. But uh, if I see something that's definitely unsafe and I'm concerned about it, I will bring it to someone's attention. I'm not the expert here. You need to look into this. Hey, Doug, this is Jim. I was in a seminar this summer, and I had a gentleman share that his uh, activity is, if, if Sal was just describing your own site, you see some things uh, maybe aren't adding up right, you have a concern, maybe it, it's not that life is in imminent danger, but you're just getting a feeling that maybe things are lax on the project. Um, his action in the past has been to document in his site report that uh, he asked the superintendent to have the uh, designated job site safety officer do an evaluation of the project as soon as possible. And that's all he said. Um, you know, and that generated a lot of conversation about, well, if you're doing that, then obviously you've seen something and somebody's going to want to know what the list is. But his statement was, you know, he wasn't obligated to do that. He just asked that the safety officer uh, visit the project, and he would document that in the site report, and that was it. And I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but uh, that was one uh, attendee's uh, statement as to how he handled safety concerns. But I would agree that we are not responsible for safety on the job site. However, per licensing laws, we are responsible to protect the public's health, safety, and welfare. And as I said, Jim and I have discussed this on this webinar in the past. So there is a duty, a legal duty, for protecting the public. And, for, and the public is not just the general public. It's people that are working there on that site. So there, you do have that duty. So if you do see something, my advice would be, that you report it in the field report, that you go to the superintendent immediately and inform him of it to let him know you put it in your field report. Document it and that way you're letting the owner know, you're letting the contractor know and to me that will have taken care of fulfilling that obligation or that duty you have to protect the public. Now, you are not required to follow up to see that it has been corrected you should not tell them how to correct it, but I do think you need to document it and report it. And, and I think Jen's comment about requesting that the safety officer do an audit of the project site is probably not a bad idea, especially if there's been more than one instance where there's been a, a, a situation like that. We could talk about safety for a while. We've got a few more slides. So, Matthew, if there's anything else, if not, let's uh, move on to the next slide. No, that looks uh, good for now. We have some questions related to photography, so we'll wait to see what yours and Jim's comments are on this slide. My suggestion would be to include 
pictures to illustrate and clarify your written observations. Um, there are plus and minuses to using pictures, and we can talk about that for a while too, but we've only got about six minutes left. I would just say um, be careful when you're using pictures. Make sure that you examine them before you include them. They should represent what you're discussing in a report, and they should not illustrate anything that is not conforming that you're not discussing in the report. So make sure you look at them before you stick them in there and pick up on any obvious non-conforming items and, and note those in the report. So I would suggest you include them. Um, I've seen it done where you list your observations and then you put the pictures after or you in this first one. However you want to do it, I, I kind of like having them interspersed so that the comment and the picture are closely in close proximity as opposed to having all the pictures at the end of the report. But I, I, with the ease and the digital technology that we have now, I could almost make an argument that you would be negligent to not include photos in, the, in, the, in your report. Um, other considerations other than pictures, documenting discussions that you had on site, uh, any kind of major discussion, major decision or, or, or issue that was raised, you may want to include that in the report. Any determinations, interpretations, decisions made by the architect or engineer that's preparing the report, uh, provided that they are not changes to the contract. You should document those. If they are changes to the contract, it's okay to put them in the report, but you need to make sure you follow up with an official document that actually changes the contract requirements. So a construction change directive, a supplemental instructions, or a change order. Um, distribution list. A lot of times at the end of the report, we'll list who we're distributing it to. That's probably a good idea so that everybody knows and who's seeing what, and you're keeping open lines of communication. Um, one thing I like to include in my reports is items that are delivered and stored on site. That also helps when you're going back and have to look at a payment application and they're asking for store materials. Um, there's a trailer on site and it's got all the, you know, it appears to have half 50% of the, of the doors required for the project. So just documenting materials that are stored on site. And it's probably also good to document in the report any known or pending claims or changes you're on site and the contractor saying, well, I think I might have to issue a, a change request because of such and such over here. That's something that I probably would include in my report. It's not authorizing a change, it's not making a change, it's just putting everybody that's going to see the report on notice that there was this discussion that there may be a change coming. So with that said, let's ask Matthew to go back and read the questions on the pictures and then we'll get Sal and Jim to comment. Uh, you're already good. Uh, both of the question comments were related to um, taking photographs that show additional work that is not documented. So I think you already touched on that uh, with your sub-bullet point there. Um, so no other questions from the audience related to that at the moment. So, uh, Jim, any comments on this slide, in particular the pictures? Uh, this is no, Al. If, go ahead, Jim. You go first. No. No, no, go ahead, man. I was going to say I didn't have any. Um, I, 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 this is Sal. In this discussion, we had uh, a 50-minute discussion at the academies on this, and I'm a, definitely a proponent of using photographs, but um, we're in a lit litigious society, obviously, and they can get you in trouble, too, so we have to be very careful. Um, I would not put any pictures in my report that don't have a meaning, and I wouldn't just put an arbitrary picture in to show the progress of the work. I, I'd be very careful about that, and I've actually seen court cases, and we talk about this in the in the seminar, where uh, someone took a picture for one reason, and in the background there was some issues, and uh, it came up later, because remember, those pictures are out there now, especially if you put them in the report, 
The other thing to remember, these pictures, these photographs that you have, if you save them, they're part of discovery. So should there be any claims on the job, and there's an attorney involved, they're going to discover all this. And there may be a picture that would uh, get you into trouble uh, unintentionally, of course. Now, if it's an issue that you're responsible for, then you're responsible for it. But um, you got to be very careful because pictures tell a lot of things. I only take pictures of specific close-ups of uh, aspects where I want to show somebody how something was done correctly or not correctly or whatever, where we are. But overall pictures, you got to be very careful about that. Um, they can uh, come back to bite you and, and haunt you, so to be very careful. But I love them. I think they tell, uh, they describe the issue much better than we can in words. So I do use them, and, and they're worthwhile. But you got to be very careful. OK. We're running short on time, so I'm going to go through these last couple of slides quickly. Uh, this slide here, and you can read it at your leisure, is some disclaimer language that I've seen uh, on some field reports. The first one actually comes from the Arcade Snapper um, application, and that's the disclaimer that they put on there. So the one below that, it starts, this report was not intended. That is kind of a conglomeration of some disclaimers I've seen on some other reports. Uh, I've seen several reports that don't have the disclaimer. So uh, that might be something you want to discuss with your attorney or your insurance carrier about whether or not you're going to have a disclaimer on your site visit report. And if so, what language is going to be? Anything, Jim, can you say before we move on? No. No, I'm good. OK. Things to remember, uh, site visits are not inspections. They're observations. We only do two inspections according to the AIA documents as substantial completion and final completion. Remember what the purpose of the report is and who your audience is. All of your observations and comments should be honest, candid, concise, complete, factual, and devoid of all editorial bias. Don't admit errors or omissions in the reports. And I've seen cases where this happens. Somebody puts, well, we messed up the details such and such. You don't want to admit that in writing in a report. I and Jim and I have talked before about if we make a mistake, we fess up to it and do what we can to correct it, but I wouldn't fess up to it in writing. Uh, I would discuss it with the owner and the contractor, but I would not put in a report that I had an error on a mission. Um, Remember, again, that the report is not a contract document. You can't use it to change contract time, work, dollars. Um, make sure you number your reports so you can track them. Also, we talked about this in the past. Every time you visit the site, you should do a report. If you're just going by to drop something off, you should do a report, and the report should state, I was by the site to drop off the paint samples. Again, you want to be clear about what you were there for. If something happened on the other side of the site and there's a lawsuit and you've got it documented that you were there and all you did was go on the trailer and drop off the paint and left, then there's no way you could have seen what happened on the other side of the site. So it just kind of helps to uh, clarify what you were doing and where you were. Because if you got a report and or you don't do a report and something has happened, there's going to be people there that you drop those paint samples off to. They're going to know you were on site. And when you get into court and you got attorneys and all that, when you were on site, why didn't you see it? And how are you going to explain that you didn't walk the site? So it just kind of clears up those kind of issues. Report the good along with the bad in your observation reports. I oftentimes will try to give kudos to contractors in the reports. Uh, they don't. They're human. All of us are human. A pat on the back can go a long way, and if they're doing a good job, I think you should tell them that they're good, doing a good job. So report the good along with the bad. It helps in developing a relationship that you have with the contractor. And also, I would suggest that you use these uh, site visits, and this goes more to the visit than the report as a marketing tool. If you can, if the owner's willing, he wants to meet the owner out at the site and walk the site with the owner. Um, Oftentimes, uh, those little subtle 
visits like that can go a long way. Anything to add, Sal and Jim, before we wrap up? I'm good. No, that's good, though. Matthew, do you want to uh, touch on this? Yeah, uh, uh, oops. yeah I'm, okay, I thought I was on mute there for a second. Uh, I just want to put a little plug in for um, the Claims, Disputes, and Critical Decisions Workshop, which is in Charlotte. It's uh, basically a CA session, all-day session. It's interactive. We have um, two programs in the morning talking about contract administration, um, very intense with Greg Markling and myself, and in the afternoon is an interact, interactive session. Uh, it used to be called Real World Applications, and we, we try to present um, real cases that have happened, and we def define uh, where they went wrong, uh, how could we avoid them. So it's a, a lesson-learned um, style of you know a process. We have uh, seven or eight different scenarios which we present. There's a little bit of role-playing involved, not a whole lot. But it's very interactive, and it, uh, it's the fastest four hours you'll ever uh, be witness to. But um, we love doing it, and it's uh, we, we learn as much as you do, and uh, I invite everyone to uh, attend if they can. It's a lot of fun. With that, we thank you all for participating. Uh, we will be doing this again next month, November 25th, same time, 12 to 1. Uh, have not decided on a topic yet. If you've got suggestions, as always, please send them to Jim or myself or to Matthew. Our emails are on the last slide right there. It's on your screen now. And again, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you everybody. Hey, good to have you, Sal. Love being here. All righty. Well, thank you, everybody. I know we went a few minutes over the hour today. I hope that didn't get in anyone's work schedules, um, but appreciate your feedback and the great conversations again today through the chat box and with, with Jim and Sal today. Uh, we look forward to seeing some of you maybe down in Charlotte if you're interested in coming to that session. And if not, like Douglas said, we'll see you in November uh, for next month's session. Thank you all and have a great day.